Father, thank you, God, for uh, giving us this time in the midweek to gather together to worship you, Lord, uh, just to set aside, God, the, uh, the office, the, the desk, the inbox, the outbox, whatever it may be, the chores, the things that need to get done, the worries, the woes, the bills. Lord, just, just the things that are the day-to-day life that we live, but, Father, we ask that you just settle our hearts and thank you for that. And we just focus on your word tonight. God, speak to us. It's, it's a wonderful book, Lord God. It's great application, but we ask that you speak to us individually tonight and congregationally, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a little of an introduction again. Last time we studied how the king we shared with you were, was preparing for war against the Grecian army. Now, there was a movie out called 300 Spartans. Has anybody seen that movie? It's about this war that this guy got involved with. And I haven't seen it. I'm not saying it's a good movie or not. I don't know what it's rated. So just somebody had told me it's, it's about this conflict. And how he threw a six-month party. I mean, think about that. And really it was, as I said last time, it was a dog and pony show for his allies, for the commanders and his officials because he was preparing for that war. Then he held a seven-day party as if six months wasn't enough. But this was a local party for all the people and we could say for all the males who were present at the Citadel. It was at that point when the wine was flowing and the king was what the scripture said, Mary, which was he was drunk. He was Mary. That he commanded Queen Vashti to come and parade herself before his drunken audience. But the Queen Vashti refused. And the king became very angry and embarrassed before those of the kingdom there, those of the citadel. So he listened to unwise counsel, and a decree was issued against all wives in the Persia kingdom that they must submit to their husband's commands and never refuse. You know, it's something when you're commanded to do it, when you're told to do it, than when you want to do it through love for your husband, for your spouse. So the the queen was fired and divorced, per se, or became one of his concubines in one hasty and angry and drunken decision. Just one. Her royal estate as queen would be given to someone else. But up to this point, before chapter 2, no one had been chosen as queen. Queen Vashti, I said last time, lost her crown, but she kept her what? Her dignity, her dignity. And although the name of God is never mentioned in this book, we saw just in chapter one how involved he is with all that is going on at this citadel. Because what's happening is it's setting up an opportunity for God to replace Vashti with a young gal by the name of Hadassah. She was a Jewish gal who will become queen. We told you that the theme of the book is the providence of God, and although his name is never mentioned, prayer is never mentioned, worship is never mentioned, all these uh, religious and godly uh, you know, words and sayings and God himself isn't mentioned. He is all over this book. You need to read ahead. You need to read the chapter, if you can, before Wednesday night. You need to read it. Read the whole book. It's not that long. And then read it again, because the wisdom, the concern, the guidance, and the foresight of God for the Jews is all over this book. Which reminds us of the purpose of the book of Esther. Not only is the theme the providence of God, but the, the purpose for why it was written is that God is not done with Israel. We can just say that. And that it reveals a satanic threat to destroy the Jewish people. And just how God continues to preserve his people. This is my iPad tonight, by the way. So uh, let's read verse 1. After these things, 
when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done and what had been decreed against her. So after these things, well, what things? Well, after the wrath of the king Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done and what had been decreed against her. And according to verse 6, three years has passed since chapter 1. And much has taken place after these things as well. During those three years, as I said, history records through the pen of Herodias that Ahasuerus goes to war with Greece as a payback and punishment for defeating his father Darius the I in battle. Ahasuerus directed a disastrous campaign, losing again, and came home in humiliation instead of honor after these things. It's always after these things, isn't it? After going to war when you're not really prepared for war, after these things, after this decree, which he probably forgot about, It's after these things when we have made foolish decisions or mistakes. It's after these things when we allow our anger to get the best of us. After these things when we allow a substance like alcohol to distort our thinking abilities to say things that we will regret the next day. Isn't it always after these things? This the king did when he was very intoxicated and angry made unwise decisions and listened to unwise counsel and he will do it again. And now the king is lonely. He's lost a battle. He comes back home. And that's not a good thing for the kingdom. Turn to Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. As I look ahead to our book studies, I see we'll be getting into the book of Job. <laughs> You know, and then into the the poetical books, but uh, I'm excited about it. But it's going to be a great challenge, and I love it. But Proverbs 23, and speaking of making bad decisions, and and looking at substance abuse and how it distorts and how it affects our thinking abilities, I may have mentioned a little bit of this last time, but I wanted us to see it in our own scriptures. It starts with there in verse 29, Proverbs 23, 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed drink, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like the one who lies at the top of a mast saying, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. And when shall I awake? that I may seek, what? Another drink. If, we all, if those of us who have uh, abused alcohol, as, as myself, and I thank God that I never became uh, addicted to it, but every time I did, I had that feeling of the ship moving. <laughs> Don't raise your hand. You know, the room spinning, you remember that? Some of you are going, Lord, don't remind me of that. You know, we've always had, we ha- some of us have had those evenings But they say the best cure for that is to take another drink, to stay drunk, uh, at least in the communities that I grew up with. And that another beer will do it. It gets you balanced again, and you go on, and it moves you on and on and on in a deeper, deeper substance abuse kind of life. But I mentioned that because um, here the king comes back, and uh, he's reminded that Vashti is no longer... And he's reminded of what she has done and what had been decreed against her there in the latter portion of verse 1. On verse 2 it says, Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. You see, as I said, it's not good when the king's unhappy. 
It's not good. It's not good in the kingdom. It's not good in the citadel. It's not good anywhere. So they're trying to give him more advice. And, and it says and in verse 3, And let the king appoint officers in all provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan, the citadel, into the woman's quarters, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, a custodian of women. And let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. Wow, this, this thing, it pleased the king, and he did so. The king's counselor's answer to the king's loneliness was young virgins, a replacement for the queen. The king's counselors fed the king's eagle and his flesh so that he will overcome his loneliness and depression. You know, Proverbs 19.19 says, A man of great wrath will suffer punishment, for if you rescue him, you will have to do it again. He's listening again to bad counsel. He's listening again to men who just want to calm the storm that they're in there in the, in, in the empire of, of the Persian media, Persian empire, and they know how this king can be. You know, loneliness is a hard place to be in. I pray for our widows here at Calvary Chapel. I have their names, and I have others who, have, who are now widowed. One of my friends, a pastor, has lost his wife just a few weeks ago. And I pray because I, I realize how lone, it's a hard place to be, man. I understand that. It can overtake one to the point of deep depression. And if not properly dealt with, we, we find ourselves making unstable decisions. I've seen that as well. You should never make decisions when you're in a place when, when something like losing a spouse or a breakup or, or a divorce takes place. You should never make any decisions until you have been, you know, walked through that, through, through counseling and, and through, you know, brothers and sisters helping you through that. People will hurry to get into a relationship, then rush into a marriage and sometimes compromise in their faith and find themselves in an unequally yoked relationship or develop unhealthy unhealthy coping mechanisms. It's a hard place to be, I get that. And Maybe some of you are there today. You're just very lonely. You you, you would love to have a partner, you'd love to have a, a, a spouse. And it's easier for me to say, just hang in there and wait and wait and let the Lord bring to you the one that you need. Or maybe you're just, you're going through a a death of a loved one. We need to be careful in those times. We need to battle against our emotions. And emotions are real, aren't they? They're real. I'm just not throwing that out. Emotions are real, man. But try not to allow them to rule our decisions. That's why, again, it's important to be connected to a church, to a community of believers, to stay in contact with other believers who care for you and will watch out for you. Fellowship is the key in a time like this, prayer and the word. And we need one another, guys. That's the only way we're going to get through it. The Lord Almighty, his word, the Holy Spirit, and fellowship with one another. Verse 5, moving on, it says there, In Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. So all that to say he was a Benjamite. He also came from uh, the line of King Saul. King Saul was a Benjamite as well, if you remember. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, from Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is, when he says brought up, he's, he, he raised her. Um, that is, Esther, his uncle's daughter. For she had neither father nor mother, which makes her a what? An orphan. It makes her an orphan. Uh, the young woman was lovely and beautiful, and when her father and mother died, 
Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So we see the difference there. Uh, here is a, a young girl who, who loses her parents, and of course the family, as we mentioned in the introduction last week, as family, Mordecai, as her cousin, but older cousin, takes her as his own daughter, adopts her, and is going to raise her, you know, and, and, and you know, love of her and watch over for her and, and provide for her. And this is what we have here. Again, these are two or more of the key figures in the book by the name of Mordecai. And again, he was one of those who stayed back after the captivity was set free. Why? I don't know. Why not go back to Judah? Why not go with those who have been released? But he stayed back. Mordecai means little man, but he would prove to be a giant in the history of the Jews. I mean, we can say, well, that's why, Mark, he stayed back so this could happen. But the fact was, God never said for them to stay there. God said for them to go back. But again, we see the providence of God and the love of God who's going to constantly take care and watch over his people, even if they're not in his perfect will. Hadassah, the, the young cousin, we could say the... The daughter, uh, the adopted daughter of Mordecai, her name means Myrtle. We know her by her Persian name, Esther, and Esther means star. And we learned that Hadassah was, was uh, taken into the home of Mordecai, again, as his own daughter. You know, as I was reading this, I was thinking, Lord, we have all been orphans spiritually at, at, at one time. We, we, we were like orphans. We were, in a sense, living our own life, living, you know, in poverty of, of our soul, living in sin, uh, just lost. Uh, uh, we, we, we took on the world. We have adopted the world as, as the one that will, that will rule us and give us direction. And, man, we were so lost, weren't we? And then the gospel comes, the opportunity to respond to God's love in his son. And I, and I love that. As, as we receive Jesus as our Savior, we, we, have, we now have been adopted. And, and with the promise that he would never leave us as orphans, that he will always be with us forever. And not only adopted, but he doesn't even see that as, see us as adopted. He sees us as his own sons and daughters. I love that. Verse 8. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard and when many young women were gathered at Shushan, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace in the care of Haggai, the custodian of women. So she was also one that was chosen. Again, the scripture says she was beautiful, and if the scripture says she was beautiful, she was what? Uh, There you go. Now the young woman pleased him, says, verse 9, and she obtained his favor. So he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace. And he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the, uh, of the, woman, of the woman. I love that. <laughs> Out of all the young virgins in the land, it just so happened, just so happened that Esther found favor in the eye of the king's chief eunuch who gave her all that she needed to be successful in this beauty contest, if you will. Just, it's just, he, he, saw, he just started giving her favor. Just, he, he, well, not just. Again, God, you see him. Don't miss the providence of God. J. Vernon McGee says, providence means that the hand of God is in the glove of human events. Yeah, there it is. I'm glad we put it up there. Write that down. That's so important. That's so true. And the glove of human events. And this is what we're seeing, man. God is giving her favor in the eyes of the, of, of the chief eunuch. And he's helping her because God is preparing her for a huge, huge duty that will come. And let us not overlook the blessing that God gives to us throughout our day-to-day life in this world. How it gives to us favors 
favor in others we work with or work for or in situations where we cannot explain the results. How did that happen? How did that take place? Why was I picked? Why, why was I given the job or, or not? And later on you think, God, thank God I didn't. But Because you know, God shows favor. He loves us. We've got to see his hand in that glove, guys. We've got to see that he's, he's there. He's for us. Verse 10. Esther had not revealed her people, meaning the Jews or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. But the question we have to ask, was this wrong? Was this wrong for Mordecai, who didn't have a problem himself identifying as a Jew, was it wrong for him to tell his cousin not to reveal her ethnicity, not to reveal that she was a, a Jew? Uh, again, we remember, they're, they're living in a Persian society, and that's all she really knew, other than what her, her cousin taught her of their faith. Uh, he wanted the cousin to keep her bloodline a secret. And Esther agreed. Mordecai wanted to protect her from the racism that was widespread at that time. And he sensed it was just the right thing for her to do. And he told her, don't reveal that you're a Jew. Just continue on. Don't reveal it. Verse 11, and every day Mordecai paced. I, I, I love this. Uh, I heard it said that pacing is the activity activity of a man who is relying on human wisdom rather than God's will. Relying on human wisdom rather than God's will. But Mordecai will soon realize that God had something greater in mind. So he's pacing his word. Parents, you know how that is. You know, you, kids go take a test or something, man, you're just praying all day and go for a job interview or Look, you can imagine that he's just pacing back and forth. Man, he's cutting the rug, man. But God has something really great in mind. And this is good for Mordecai because it's going to build his faith too. It's going to build his, his faith in God. Verse 12 says, And each young woman's turn came uh, to go into the king Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months' preparation according to the regulations for the women. For thus were the days of their preparation apportioned, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with perfumes and preparation for beautifying women. They had to get rid of that camel smell that they lived with all their life. And thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the woman's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the woman, to the custody of Shazgaz, <laughs> the king's unit, who kept, I love these names, man, who, who kept the concubines. And she would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. Twelve months to get ready. Husbands, something just never changes, does it? Twelve months? Are you kidding me? You'll be in that car for a long time waiting. It says in the evening she went, and in the morning she returned. Now you really get sober and realizing, yeah, they are living in a Persian society. I don't have to draw pictures for you, do I? That what is taking place here in this overnight meeting with this king one out of 400 would be chosen. And scholars tell us that the other 399 would be banished to a harem where they stayed the concubine of the king, but rarely, rarely would they, if, any, if ever, see him afterwards. And they were never free to remarry. They just would live as a perpetual widow. Wow. That's heavy. That was 
That was the world, that was the land. Verse 15, now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of of Ahiel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's unit, the custodian of the women, advised. He knew. He knew the ins and outs. He knew what it would take for her to, to win the crown. So she just trusted him. 16, so Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus and to his royal palace. In the 10th month, which is the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign, and the king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast. He likes feast, don't he? The feast of Esther for all his officials and servants. And he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. Ah, we made the king happy. That's all these people cared about. They just cared about their neck. The king's happy now. The king's got a queen. Everybody's happy. All throughout the citadel. All throughout. All throughout provinces of which he ruled. But this was a lot of work to go through just to be accepted by the king. Imagine 12 months of preparation, oils and skin care and all the things, you know, the cosmetics, the the things that they would put on and, and the presentations and no doubt that's not counting the clothing and the wardrobe and 12 months. I'm so glad we serve a king that takes us as we are, amen? The true king of kings and the Lord of lords. I mean, some of us try to get cleaned up before we come to him, and as we tell you, you can't get clean. There is no launderer that will make you any (laughs) cleaner than, than you think. God says, come as you are. You may be tore up from the floor up and look like it. And God says, yeah, come son, come daughter. Come as you are, I will change you. You will grow, you will mature. I love that, man. No makeup, no cleanup. Just sinners who realize that they fall short of God and want to make it right with them through Jesus Christ. As Esther is capped with a worldly crown, we believers who have been chosen by God from the foundation of the world, that I'm still trying to wrap my head around, will be crowned with a heavenly one. And then we will lay them at our Savior's feet. One day, guys. Esther won. She was crowned and became the king's queen and wife. But little did she know that God was in the shadows moving the king's heart to make that choice and what great things God would do through Esther. You guys know the story. If not, just hold on. Put your seatbelts on. It's, it's, a, it's a cool ride. It says, when the virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat with the king's gate. And now we're switching scenes back to the king's gate. Um, the gate is where decision-making took place. The gate is where men of influence would would be seated, would be present there in the kingdom. They would sit. And it's interesting that it's where Mordecai sat. It seems that he held some kind of position of influence. Verse 20 says, Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had changed her. For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. And I'm sure Mordecai... He's wiping his forehead, thinking, whew, man, we got away with it. We got away with it. And now Esther is set for life. I mean, Mordecai wants Esther to live in peace, but God will challenge both of them. God, again, as I said, will test her faith as we studied on Sunday, and Abraham's faith was tested. And that because so the Jews would not be cursed but blessed. Now you got away with it. 
but stand by. Because too, too much is given what much is required. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Verse 21, in those days while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Big Van <laughs> and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on the king of Hazarus. There's always those who, are, who have uh, big heads and uh, want to take the king out, want to take the leader out. They're everywhere. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther. And Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. I love that. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book of Chronicles, not our Chronicles, but the, chron- the Chronicles, but the Chronicles of the kingdom here in the presence of the king. So it was written down. This incident was written down. It was written in the book, in their books. Now because of his love and care and concern for this adopted daughter of his, Mordecai is in just the right place to overhear plans of an assassination attempt to the king. Just so happened to be in the right place, right? Remember, coincidence is not a kosher word. And he reveals it, and the plot is thwarted. However, other than having his name written in the, the chronicles of the king, Mordecai remains anonymous and unrewarded. But there's a plan for that and a reason. He was at the right place. He was at the right time. He gave forth the news to Esther for her to tell the king and also for her, for her to have more favor with the king in and, and hearing this. But she mentions his name, and she wants to do that. Mordecai is the one who told this. They did an inquiry. They found that it was true. They hung the two guys. Boom. And I know many of us maybe have done great things, and maybe you feel you have not been rewarded. Maybe you feel that you have not been given that pat on the back or notoriety. I mean, it's just something maybe uh, like a pebble in your shoe. You know, just, it would be nice if someone would just tell me, you know, good job, great. You know, we all want to hear that. We should encourage one another. Don't get me wrong, but maybe some of you are here today and you're, you've done some great things, you, but you've just never gotten that pat on the back or that notoriety. But we have to understand as, as we continue in this book that God is in control. And if Mordecai was rewarded now, he would not be rewarded later on and receive a greater blessing and being used by God in chapter 6. I was, uh, oh yeah, great, we got time. I was reading about a story of a missionary who came back after 20 years serving in, in Africa if you, if you don't mind, I'd like to read it to you. An old missionary couple had been working in Africa for 20 years, and they were returning to New York City to retire. They had no pension. Their health was broken. They were defeated, discouraged, afraid. They were done. They discovered that they were booked on the same ship as President Teddy Roosevelt, who was returning from one of these big game hunting expeditions. Y'all know Teddy, right? Hope you know your history. No one paid much attention to them. They, they watched a fanfare that accompanied the president's entourage with passengers trying to catch a glimpse of, of the great man. And as the ship moved across the ocean, the old missionary said to his wife, something is wrong. Why should we have given our lives in faithful service to God in Africa all these many years and have no one care a thing about us? Here is this man comes back from a hunting trip And everybody makes much over him, but no one gives two hoots about us. Don't raise your hand if it sounds familiar. (laughs) Dear, you shouldn't feel that way, his wife said. I can't help it. It doesn't seem right. Well, when the ship docked in New York, a band was waiting to greet the president. The mayor and all the dignitaries were there. Papers were full of the president's arrival. 
but no one noticed this missionary couple. They slept off the ship and found a cheap flat on the east side, hoping the next day to see what they could do to make a living in the city. But that night, the man's spirit broke. He said to his wife, I can't take this. God is not treating us fairly. And his wife replied, why don't you go into the bedroom and tell that to the Lord? Aren't you glad for those wives of ours? <laughs> a short time later, he came out from the bedroom, but now his face was completely different. And his wife asked, dear, what happened? And the Lord, the Lord settled it with me, he said. I told him how bitter I was that the president should receive this tremendous homecoming when no one met us as we returned home. And when I finished, it seems as though the Lord put his hand on my shoulder and simply says, but you're not home yet. You're not home yet. Revelation 22:12 12 says, and behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Guys, we're not home yet. And although we, we love the, you know, the thank yous and the good jobs and the, you know, pats on the back, sometimes I'll, I'll tell someone, you know, you know, I'd pat you on the back, but your hand's in the way. And... But God knows not only what we have done for him, but why we did it, the attitude we had, the gratitude we, we received in doing it. Amen? Guys, as Mordecai was able to reveal, as the worship team comes forward, as Mordecai was able to reveal this matter again, as it was written down in the Chronicles, it will come back again to help him and to help the Jews and, and, to, and to help the, the problem that was going on with the hate for God's people. But there's a plot today that an enemy has to destroy man. There's a plot today that we know about. That Lucifer wants to take out as many as he can and bring them to hell. And we know it. We know that. Because we were on that way. We were on that path as well. So we have the, the secret. We have the, the key. We have the answer to life. That, 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 that he wants to take out as many as he can. The plot has been revealed to us. It's been revealed to us in the Bible. And we must tell others. We must tell others to save their life from our enemy, from the one who wants to take us out. And we must ask God, Lord, make a way, Lord, use me if there is any time, Lord, or any way that I could preach the gospel, tell others, warn them, there's a plot against them, and they gotta get right with the Lord. They can come to him just as they are. No preparation, no perfume, just the way they is, man, and God will receive them. All right? You got it? Thank you, God. Thank you so much that it was revealed to us this plot, this hatred for, for our souls, Lord, by an enemy that we ran with and partied with and talked with and hung with, Lord, until that day when someone shared with us the plot that was against us, that he wasn't a friend, he was an enemy. Thank you for the days, Lord God, that we all have the date when we came to you, God, broken before you, receiving you as Lord and Savior. God, put that desire in our heart, Lord, to tell others. We can't speak it in a sense at work. We can live it. But eventually we'll tell on ourselves, God. We will never deny you, Lord. You will never deny us. We will never deny you nor forsake you. Give us opportunities, God. We pray this week.